Hello, I'm Akria Janfi and welcome to this BFI at Home discussion on the brand new drama for BBC One and Netflix, You Don't Know Me. Adapted from the novel by Imran Mahmood by the writer Tom Edge, You Don't Know Me tells the story of Hero, played by Samuel Adewumi, a young man from South London who is in the dock for murder. And from Imran's perspective, You Don't Know Me challenges us to know our neighbours better in order to celebrate our similarities and close our eyes to the things that divide us. So it's my pleasure to introduce the cast and creators from You Don't Know Me. Samuel Adewumi playing Hero, Sophie Wilde playing Kyra, Imran Mahmood, the novelist, Samad Masood, director, and Rinke Atto, producer. Welcome to you all. Thanks Hi. for having us. Hi, I felt so formal, but hello, welcome. Yep. <laughs> Imran, let's go back to the beginning. Where did the concept for your novel come from? And yeah, and some of the themes that you explore in it, why was it important that Maybe not why was it important, but where did it all come from? What was the, the, the inspiration around it and behind it? Uh, <clears throat> okay, so um, by day, I'm a, a criminal barrister. And um, there was one day, the, the day I remember um, was a day that I was in a, a roping room in a, in a Crown Court. And I was uh, representing um, a young man on a murder charge. And it had got to the point in the trial where we, were, we had to write speeches. So I was writing my closing speech. And he had, a very bright guy in fact, and he'd had pages of stuff that he wanted me to include in the speech. And I was sitting down there and I was writing it and I was going through it and I was thinking, well, I can't put this bit in it. And I can't put this bit in it because there were, there were all these kinds of ideas that he had, which were great. But for legal reasons or for kind of reasons of style or rhythm or whatever it was, they, they couldn't feature in the speech. So I, when I'm doing the speech, I have to do, try and strike the balance between writing something which is persuasive, writing something which hits all the legal points, and writing something which hits all the factual points. And you've, you've kind of got to blend it all in one. And as I was writing it, it suddenly occurred to me, you know, if I wasn't there doing it, what would the speech sound like if it was written by the defendant himself? Because as I say, he was bright and he was charming and he had all these kind of fantastic ideas about the way that the case fit together in his own head. And so once that case was over, I just sat down and I thought, I wonder what it would sound like if I actually wrote, wrote that speech out. Um, what are the things that he would concentrate on as opposed to the one things that I would concentrate on? And it occurred to me that, for him, the th what he would want to do, I think, is to draw that parallel between his life and the life of the people who are trying him. Because there's there's this fiction that we, in in our jury system, we've, we've got a system where we are tried by our peers. That, that's the idea. The idea is that we are tried by um, men and women who are our peers. But in reality, we're not. We're in a criminal justice system where most, most people who go through it are young men. That's the, that's the starting point. And the second thing that they are usually is that they are underprivileged. So our juries aren't made up like that. Our, our juries are made up of over, often overprivileged, often white, are often educated or highly educated or privileged um, with a smattering of uh, uh, other things in between. And, and I, I began to wonder whether there was ever going to be any real parallel between their lives the lives of a jury and the life of a defendant. And I thought a defendant who's trying to communicate his story is going to, is going to look at the kind of jumping off points where there are similarities. And for him, it would be his humanity, the things that make him human are, are, are the ways in which he could reach out. And so that was really what was at the heart of it. So the story of You Don't Know Me is really, a, it's a love story because th that's what he's, he's trying to say. The hero is saying, look, we are similar because we're all driven by love and everything is really another face of love, whether it's um, the love that drives us into a, a situation or the love that um, creates circumstances or deals with underprivileged or deals with challenges. It, it all has an aspect of love. And so all of those characters in there, so Blair is the moral heart and she represents kind of family, mum represents family, hero represents the kind of lens or the mirror through which everybody is seen. Uh, Kyra is the uh, kind of emotional heart. Um, so that's my, that's my very long answer, <laughs> a very short question. I'm at a 
two years ago. Before any of this kicked off anyway. It's because it, it, it does cover so many themes and it can be interpreted in so many different ways. And the fact that you see that it's a love story, there's a criminal justice story, there's a social economic story, there's there's some potentially race, race, racial lines stories and stuff like that, and mass, male masculinity, vulnerability, and all sorts of and mental health. And you know, there are a lot of themes in this, you know, four part series. So I, I can understand why the, um, the, your answer is longer, but it, it, it's really good to hear where you were where, where you were inspired and where it comes from. And I guess for the makers, so Sam Director and Renki, what were the themes that you first kind of empathised with or related to when trying to understand the project and bringing it to life, how you were going to work together to bring it to life? Um, Sam Director, uh, can you let me know, we'll come to you first for that. Um, what's interesting, my first feature was a, my only feature, was a feminist Western set in Pakistan. And I'd always said Trojan horse within that was a story about a father and a daughter. And I think this was the same. It's like, it's a guy on trial for murder, but Trojan horse within that is a love story. He ultimately does it for a girl. Um, and that was really appealing. What's also appealing is just the character was, um, just really interesting. And I don't think we've ever seen uh, a young black man in a courtroom speaking for four hours. Like that's a perspective we've not really seen. And it kind of set off stuff for me. And I was like, this, there's just a lot of good material. You know, anytime you've got voiceover and flashbacks, it's like, hello, you know, that's great for a filmmaker. But it was just done really intelligently by Tom. And then you look around and then we start casting. And Sam's right. I bumped into him in another country and I was kind of like secretly stalking him. Do you know what I mean? I was like, how are you? You know, just trying to hear him in real life and to just get some stuff out of him just to think, what do you look like in a suit? Do you know what I mean? But um, we just constantly did that. And I was really proud, like, through the casting to put so much life and character into those characters where they were no longer performing. It was like they were telling us. And, and on set, it was a lot of, what would you do in this situation? Like, what would you actually say? Would you say that? Would you say that? And then all of those things inform the script. And Tom's really cool with, this is what we've got, shoot that please. But if you're gonna elevate at any point, do that on the floor. And we kind of, we did that. There's a little bit of pushback, but it, it ultimately I think you get a good project because of it. If, if no one's got an ego and ultimately you wanna make something that's, that, that makes everyone proud, then I think you're in a good place. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, Aquia, but. No, it does, it does. Cool. <laughs> um, and Renkie, what, again, what jumped at you first and what was like, yeah, this is it, but we need to, honing in on this or that and the other what was important to you from this story? yeah I think when I read the script I was blown away because um for me you know I grew up in Brixton and what I what connected me to this is not only the universal theme of love you know the the celebration of black love which is rare to see um on tv especially British tv but it was about the characters that I could see through hero you know the characters that against the prejudice, they've sort of gone out, made a career, made a life for themselves um, against all odds, against the prejudice. They've sort of made a good life for themselves, educate themselves and, and, and did the best for their families. So he was, he was a very human character. And mm. the other thing I loved about him was the fact that, you know, his character also demonstrated, you know, an attentive, caring, um, uh, and meaningful relationships with, with the females in his life, you know, his mum and his sister. She was like, look after this one. What kind of muffin was this? Blueberry. You don't ever meet me at the bus stop with blueberry muffins. And I gave birth to you. Yeah, it's different, Mum. stalking you uh, anyway. I wasn't stalking. You were a bit. It's okay, I'm happy about it now. Uh, you were happy about it at the time, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> these men show love and care and and that's what he represented 
And so, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, my brothers, for example, some of my brother's friends, you know, who were pushed into situations, they find themselves in these situations and they, they have to make the most of it or make peace with it, you know, um, or get past it to create a better life again. So I think he definitely represented a well-rounded figure for me. And I was just like, wow, you know, finally. Um, and I think, you know, he's very honorable and courageous and, and you know, the show was full of high state, raw emotion, ambition and drive. And I just felt like as a producer, you're looking for material that makes, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And, and for me, this, this was it. It was like, man, please, like Ruth and Jenny at the time, you know, one of the execs, I was like, look, I need to be a, a part of this because it's incredible. And obviously Imran set this, set this up in his book. And then Tom just went in on the emotions and, 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 and and that and everyone coming together to just elevate it you know and and bring in our own personal experiences um yeah which which just made it feel so real and so relatable um and i think also again we're so used to seeing these this what maybe i mean it's changing now but there was always this one point of view or perspective for blackness and there is a variation of blackness blackness is is on a spectrum you know so those repre representations are important and for us this was just another um representation and thank you um sophie and sam uh, renke mentioned that finally moment when you read a script and it's like oh god yes yeah, speaking to me and, and not in a way that makes me want to throw the script across the floor what was it about what again the same same question but it is what was the oh god finally i can't wait and i'm so glad this has come my way um sam what was that for you what was that moment for you um, for me, I think it started when, or that moment was uh, similar to Renko actually, when I when I got the script. Um, I felt like Hero was a character that <clears throat> I, f I feel uh, I could relate to. Um, <laughs> but like, he, he just, uh, he, he felt like, he just felt very real. Like he didn't, he felt very real. He felt like a really sort of normal guy in like these sort of crazy circumstances, which, you know, being like, <laughs> You know, growing up in London, like you, that can happen wherever you're from. Do you know what I mean? But he he just felt like someone that felt really well rounded. He felt like he had a really strong sort of sense of morality, a sense of um, like core values. You know, and and like Rinky said, I think one of the main things for me was how he related to the to the women in his life. You know, uh, specifically his mom and his sister, and obviously Kyra when she comes into his life. There was just like a there was a sensitivity to him that I think uh, isn't often isn't often afforded to like young black characters from London. Do you know what I mean? I think um, I don't know. It just felt it just felt like a very well rounded character, and I felt that from <clears throat> when I first read the books from that 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 the book that Imran wrote, I just thought like, wow, this character is like really really interesting. He comes across like he's from the ends, but like. You know, he's about trying to just like live his life as peacefully as he can, trying to provide for his family. And there are so many people uh, like that who don't often get um, the representation that I think their stories also deserve. You know, so um, yeah, there was there was that element to him being like a real sort of grounded, uh, loving, really interesting character to explore as well as all the other stuff that was going on in the background um, and like being like a, I guess somehow being like a product of his environment in a way, you know, and, and not necessarily being able to uh, get away from the fact that he lives where he lives and certain things happen. Um, but also the fact that, you know, through the love that he had for this girl, because he, he seemed to be living his life pretty all right before before she came in before she comes into it and the fact that it's his love for her that drives him into becoming this this hero do you know what I mean that drives him to into this bravery that I don't think he would have found if it wasn't for for their love and their connection and I just think that's just like a I just think that's a beautiful motivator for an for an actor to work with it's like wow like you know, I'm not just doing these things. It's not hard to justify why these, why, why he goes through the uh, or makes the choices that he makes. It's all founded in in a really strong emotion. Um, and yeah, I feel like I got that from the first sort of episode, um, as well as when I read the book. Definitely. Do not.
I'm not a drug dealer. And thankfully, I've never been in a gang. Want to know what I did? I sold cars. I love my job. And until Jamil came in that day, I doubt we'd ever talk longer than 10 seconds. Yes. All right, Jamil. It's good. Looking for a car, isn't it? What are you thinking? Sound fast. Move us to come on. No space for the gal, isn't it? <laughs> How much are you looking to spend? If our money's not a problem, do your job, innit? Yeah, what's this one saying? This one's 85 bags on the road. Sound system? Arm and garden. It's loud. Discounts for paying cash? I'll have to talk to the manager about that one. Alloys? Come standard. I mean, you could pay for the satin black BBS rims. Probably get you pulled over three times a day, though. <laughs> Do you think I'm down? Already got a shit car for mash and work. This one's just for fun, you see me? How much does sit Kyra in the back seats for the night as well? What? You heard what I said. <laughs> Alright, yeah, you're done. Leave. <laughs> Big man, it's a joke. I'm deaf. I said you and your little boys can take your cracker pocket money some other place, yeah? Don't mind your mouth, you bitch. Are you tapped? Is everything alright here? And Sophie, what was your final moment when you saw the script, read the script? I mean, I think for me, like, I'm, I'm Australian and kind of black stories are largely omitted from um, Australian screens. And so to be able to be a part of this project was, like, felt personally really important for me um, and, like, an opportunity that I wouldn't be afforded back home. So, so that was something that I found really appealing. But I think the script itself and, and the storytelling structure I found really interesting and I really liked that there's this kind of ambiguity between um, truth and fiction and, and you as an audience, uh, the onus is on you to, to decide what you believe. And I, I thought that was really interesting. Like I hadn't seen um, a show like that before. Thank you. Um, and just speaking to the, it, it, you see how easily it is that people's lives just like, living their everyday lives and the next minute you're embroiled in this world of turmoil, violence and destruction for whatever way you, you know, whether it's to survive or just you know, and actually to just survive. How did you find the balance of not sensationalizing it so it's like unbelievable? Because sometimes, you know, we, I'm sure we've all heard stories or know people who have had such a wild existence and something that you're like, oh my God, I would never do that. But it's just so easy how Hero can just slip into these things for the one to save um, Kyra. How did you manage that? Um, considering the audience needing to believe and be engaged with the story and not think, well, this is just like a Hollywood blockbuster dram dramatization of something that could never happen to me. Um, a Sam director, I'll go to you for, on that. Well, I think that's the crux of the whole show isn't it? Like we always say it's a story about an ordinary guy in extraordinary, extraordinary circumstances. And in Imran's book, um, I mean, I only read it once. And then once we had the script, I didn't touch it. Sorry, Imran. I left it somewhere, mate. Um, but the whole, what stuck out for me from that book was there's a scene in the book where Hero's in a, in a wardrobe, I think, or he's in a room and he's got a gun. And, and the gun speaks to him. He's like, I can hear the gun. It's like, it was this thing in my hands. Uh, I'm paraphrasing Imran. Sorry. But he's like, I could just feel this thing. And it was talking to him. And I, and I remember when we got the script, I, I said it was really important for us to be in the wardrobe with him. If he's in that cupboard or whatever it is, I want to be right next to him and him be like, shit, what am I doing in this circumstance? And that was what was really important, I think, is put our audience where our lead is. And he's not Schwarzenegger, no offence, Sam. He's an ordinary guy, do you know what I mean? And he's not martial arts trained or anything, doesn't know how to operate a gun but he's, he just keeps spiraling. He's like, you know, when you're like, don't go downstairs, he's going to go downstairs because he loves this girl and he's got to do that thing. And our job or my job as a dramatist was to try to put my audience there right next to him when he's making those choices and you're like, what are you doing, mate? But it's got to feel genuine, authentic and mo motivated. And Sam pulls that off in every instance where you're like, uh, should he be doing this thing or not? And because we're doing this now, these q and I got asked to, to fill in some questions the other day and they were like what are your favorite scenes and one of them is like 
completely not me, it's Sam. And I said this to him the other day. He goes to get this gun and he knocks on the door uh, and he's been told to ask for this kid called Jamie. And a, and a young kid who's about 12 answers the door and Sam plays it so smart. He's, all he says is, is Jamie there? But on his face, it's like, what the fuck is going on here? Why is this kid going to give me a gun? And the kid gives him a gun. It was, that was, for me, is like, that is exactly how I would react. And I don't, don't know if you ever remember the like, Beatles about from in the old days. Yeah, yeah. But if you look at that, I remember one of our tutors saying, if you watch that, when someone is being pranked, their reaction is actually nothing. They're confused. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know what? Here's your car. And they open it and there's no engine in it. The guy doesn't cry. He doesn't scream. They do the smallest reaction. And Sam and Sophie and all our cast most of the time made those smart choices, which to me made it feel like, shit, I'm actually there. We're not sensationalizing it. This is how I would react in that circumstance. And I think if you can do that, then your audience is with you on that journey. It's Jamie. You from Marlow? Yeah. I know there were no prints on the gun they got in my flat. So, like my lawyer said, it being in my flat, it's not proof of anything. For Sophie, you know, playing Kyra, Kyra is such a complex woman. She's got so many things going on. I love our three portal to, um, to who she is, is through books. So I just love that. Bring back books and save the book. Um, it's just interesting. You see there's so many sides to you know, someone could see her as a victim, someone could see her as extremely strong and brave. Um, someone could see her as quite irritatingly, like frustrating, like speak, share what's going on. And, you know, but it's that you're silenced and you can't, you're trying to protect people in your silence, but also, you know, you, it's Kyra needs saving in some way. So what was it like bringing her to life, but also, I don't know, how did you get in touch with her and, and, and what does she mean to you? I mean, I think what's so wonderful is like so much of it is on the page and, and it's Tom's writing, um, which makes my job a lot easier, obviously, when, when the writing's so good. Um, and so, yeah, I think in terms of, of the complexity, it's, it's there on the page, it's there in the words. Um, and I think having, you know, such an amazing cast and, and Sam to, to guide me, um, was really useful in in kind of creating that character, but you know I think I think I relate to her in so many ways, and and she's so real, and her kind of problems are are so grounded in humanity, and and you know I think fundamentally it is all about love, and and love is so important to her, and 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 she's a person who feels things so deeply, and and really really loves people, but I think it's it's that trauma that's forced her to, to build up these walls and, and and it's through her relationship with Hero that I think she she finds the ability to trust people again. And so I think it's it's a powerful journey and and as as an actor really satisfying to be able to play someone so complex and and multifaceted and yeah. Can we do this again though? I mean, the eating together part, not the trying to kiss you part. You didn't really try and kiss me. Okay, well, I really liked all of this. I'll make you dinner tomorrow. You want to come here for seven? I can do that, yeah. Thank you.
thank you. And Sam, hero, his name is, is in the name. Um, and how did you hone in into his heroism, especially being it's like a modern day hero? What would a hero look like in an estate um, trying to save his family from the elements that are pushing towards it, trying to get at him and his situation and trying to save Kyra? How did you lean into the fact that his name is hero and he's a modern day real world hero? I haven't actually gotten confirmation on this. I don't. I never thought his name was Hero. Um, I thought it was just a name that we gave to this sort of unnamed character in the show <clears throat> that maybe described how we wanted the uh, the audience to see him, and that was kind of my interpretation of him. And so, um, yeah, I think I think what really nails it is is uh, or what really gives him that title is the fact that he is just like like Sam said, he's just like an ordinary guy in extraordinary circumstances that's having to really um, kind of step out of himself, like really like elevate himself and and, um, and kind of become someone that maybe he always had the seeds of becoming, but never would have really tried to become if it wasn't for this person that he loves, that he sees as going through a crazy situation. Um, and so that's what I could really like connect with, you know, he's, He's not really a hero. He's just someone that's trying to do the right thing um, by the people that he loves. And um, I think Tom really captured that element within the script, which was, you know, you know, he's not going around punching people up, you know, shooting everyone he can. It's not like it's not it's not one of those sort of revenge type stories. Um, it's just very grounded in, in a reality that you could see existing. Um, and, you know, I think what really makes him a hero is like, you know, when you're watching those films and you're like, what are you doing? Like, don't, don't, don't go, don't open that door. Like, don't go into that house. Um, and yet through stupidity, someone ends up going in. For him, it was through bravery. He knew he shouldn't go into the house. He knew he shouldn't be doing all of the things that he was doing. But, um, you know, when you love someone, it can, it can drive you to do things that you never would have thought you'd be able to. And um, yeah, I think, I think that's what makes our central character a hero. Yo, fam, uh, Kyra dipped. It's got to hurt, man. I feel for you. I really do. Do you know anything? Maybe where she might have went. Does he look like fucking social services, cuz? Hey, I got reach. Got houses all over the sea. How many rounds we got now? I don't know. We got, like, 20 rounds. Easy. I'm doing 120 rocks a day, boy. She's on these streets. That's where I be. Anything you can do, bro? Yes. But I'm gonna need you to do something for me first. Like what? I don't know. Maybe you could hold time for me. That's not really my bag, man. Well, this business. I know what you want, you know what I want. That's how it works. It's in a whip. It's nice. What? Oh, that's a fucking car, boy. What are you doing? Get down. Get down. <laughs> and how did you two lean on each other in the more challenging scenes? Because um, there are some emotional scenes that are quite, I mean, and harrowing, maybe a big word, but there are really intense scenes between the two of you. How did you lean, lean on each other to get each other through that, through those? Um, I, it's open to both of you. I mean, Sam's such a beautiful actor and scene partner and so giving and I think that made, made my job a lot easier and I always felt really safe on set um being with him and yeah I love him I love you I love you Sam I love you too baby um <laughs> yeah it's um it's the same I think like and I'm gonna use like I'm gonna bring in the whole cast as well because I think yeah for sure me and Sophie have some really like intense moments um and I can only really echo what Sophie said, like she's a beautiful, beautiful actress um, and a really just like kind and uh, warm person. And so uh, it's, it, it was very easy to fall in love with her on screen. Do you know what I mean? As, as much as we had the difficulties of COVID and all that stuff, like she's, she's just a, like, she's an incredible actor and just like a really lovely person. And when those things like merge, it, it, it's, uh, I don't know. I feel like it's just like a, a match sort of made made in heaven. Um, I'm going to stop gassing you now. But um, <laughs> when, when we talk about our whole cast as well, like everyone, 
I, I think Sam and Rinkia and, uh, and Ruth and Gary Davey, who was our casting director, I, I just think they, they, they tapped into something that I think when, when you see it, you just know it to be real. Um, and I think that's what every actor kind of brought. They brought elements of themselves. They brought their love and passion for the story. Um, they brought their, uh, their passion for their characters. And everyone really can, seemed to connect with their characters in a real honest way. And so it means that like, when we're working on set, I can trust this person. Like, our read through was incredible. Um, and it was really emotional. And from then I was just like, I trust all these guys. You know, I trust exactly what they're going to do. Some names like you're not going to know. Um, but like, I think like be excited. There's, there's a lot of like really, really like beautiful performances in, in the show. And I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of, of these wonderful uh, talents. So Imran, having your words adapted, maybe torn to shreds a little bit, reshaped and reworked. What was that like having the conversation with Tom Edge, who's the writer? Um, what conversations did you have with Tom when it came to adapting your words into a screenplay? Um, and were, were there any major changes that there's a little bit of back and forth on and, and you know, having to understand why this had to stay, why this had to go? Um, what was that like for you? Actually, it was really easy. Um, it, it's, you know, enormously helped <clears throat> by the fact that Tom is just a master of what he does. He's just so good. And I always had the feeling that the, the product is different. So the, some novelists get very um, precious about their novels being turned into adaptations and they, particularly where there are changes. And I've always taken the view that they're different things. So the book is the book and the TV is the TV. And although everybody, are, the first question we ask you when, when you've written a novel is, has it been made into a TV show? That's the first thing they ask you. Which is a strange thing because if you are a painter, nobody says to you as soon as you painted something, oh, has it been made into a sculpture yet? Or, you know, somebody, somebody made it into a statue. Because they are different art forms. And so I was always totally comfortable with it being different or totally different or as different as uh, um, Tom wanted to make it, as long as it was conveying that central story and the heart of it was still there. And so um, when Sam, director, takes it along and transforms what Tom, Tom has done to it, it you know, into something visual, really visual, and adds his sprinkling of magic. It, in fact, buckets of magic by the time I saw it. It was just, you know, it was incredible. And I'm sure you know, Tom would say the same thing, that having his words kind of trans, transformed into something visual, um, it, it must be a strange experience because it's it's still on the page when he's doing it. And then the next thing he knows, he's seeing it on a, on a TV screen. And I'm sure he felt when, when he was watching it, as I felt, which was that it was ex, it was an extraordinary thing. I was very, you know, I was, I was very, I was moved by the performances. The performances are just outstanding. Um, just so lucky to have Sophie and Sam and Bookie and all of them. It was just all brilliant. You couldn't see a weak link in the whole production. And so, yeah, I'm very happy <laughs> as a novelist. And not many novelists can say that when it comes to adaptations, but I'm thrilled. I think Tom has said that the audience or the people watching are like the 13th member of the jury, because it's not forgetting that you've got this whole world, but its central focus is this courtroom drama where Hero is fighting for his life, as it were, and we, the audience, are the 13th member of the jury. How did you, Sam, director, approach keeping our attentions on this kind of monologue which is expanding into an outer world, but then coming back to focus in the, in the courtroom. How did you navigate how that would work on screen? I think this was one of the really early questions they asked me as well, actually, when I went in to meet Ruth and talked about Magic Dust. She was like, um, I think I got past the Magic Dust meeting and then I got called in again uh, and the head of BBC was there. And they were, they were just talking about what do we do about the courtroom? And um, I said, without well, sounding pretentious, I was like, there's a Hungarian film. I don't know if you've seen it, uh, Son of Soul. And uh, they were like, all oh, right, what's that all about? And, I, and in that, it, it basically pivots around the lead. So the whole thing is focused on this guy and it moves around him and it doesn't give you conventional sort of coverage. It doesn't necessarily say, now this is the wide shot, this is the close-up. 
And I said in the courtroom, I think everyone kind of knows, you know, the judge is over there, jury's over here, his mum's going to be over there. I think let's establish it once. And then if it's about him, and like you said, his name's not actually a hero, he's just the lead and we didn't give him a name. So we call him, you know, he could be a nameless man who's in the lead role, but we just refer to him as hero in the script. So I said, if it's hero, then let's stay with him. If it's his point of view, let's be close to him. And that is something me and the DP, Andy Mack, who's a saint, uh, talked about how do we get very close to him in a courtroom and show our audience a perspective you've not really seen. Um, and something Sam sort of touched on earlier about the every man, what we try to do in this, in the show is probably not cut out the bits other people do where you're about to make a decision or a choice and you might cut it out for story, but we try to stay on Sam just a, a bit longer than you normally might. So you'd stay on that character as he's thinking, which is dangerous on TV because you the guy's not doing anything, you think, but I think he's doing a lot. And again, Sam's choices or Sophie's, people would make the right choices, which for me would be like, I'd stay on there a little bit longer because you are thinking and it's communicating something. So respecting our audience and saying, we're not going to go bang, bang, bang. I'm going to show you a perspective you've not seen before. And the guy down there is a bloody good actor. And if he speaks, you're going to listen and I'm not going to cut away. And you'll find the places where we don't cut away. It just works, I think. Uh, I'm biased because we made the show, but I think it works. Do you know what I mean? Like, let's hold on him. Let's show you something you haven't seen, which will prevent you from getting bored. Um, yeah, I, I think that was really important. And I just want to go back to something Sam was talking about, the read-through. And so that, that read-through was really important for, for me as well to see, because it was COVID, you never really see everyone together. But it was a bit like this, where you've got everyone in these small little boxes. And you could just see that we had a 98% black cast probably. And to see everyone in these little boxes was just really sort of empowering for us all. And I asked everyone at the end of it just to stop for a moment and look around at the person next to you in these little boxes, because that's really important that you see yourself being reflected and we're all coming together. Um, and as much about race, it was about class as well. I thought, you know, that was really important as well. You know, you can pretend like this background, but, you know, everyone knows where you where you are or uh it was important that we lent into that and used that as our power when we were making the show. And it, it's very rare, I think. I mean, I've not got the longest career in the world, but to turn up on set and to knock about with people you would generally break bread with was really nice. And it, I genuinely believe it comes through in the show how these two behave, Sam and Sophie behave on set, on camera. It, like Rinka said, there's love there. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of love between these two and it, and it filtered throughout the whole crew. And it creates an environment where you can be fearless, you can take risks and you can enjoy yourself and express yourself. And it's all good. We'll capture that. You know, what I appreciate about the, the episodes that I've seen is the authenticity and the scenes that stood out was just when it was so relatable. And I love, you know, the family scenes where my mum's breaking into dialect and then English and switching between that's so very my home background <laughs> and it's just those are the nuances that are so important when stories like this are being told especially when you're dealing with a cop with a um, with a cultural community that aren't represented in the best way in the majority of things that we see on screen so i'm just i really definitely appreciate those scenes of authenticity because that's what helps us broaden the scope and perspectives on who we are as humans despite our disparate in spite of our differences culturally or class and things like that but for you guys just before just to wrap up can you each of you just tell us a scene that best just really all encompasses why this project is important to you and what you hope the audience the scene that you hope the audience gets it from the way that you got it um i'll start with you rinky again and then just go around the room um, well, from my community, we're used to code switching. We're able to navigate in different spaces. And that was a, that, that was the thing that we had to bring um, to make it feel authentic. We brought, we brought our personal experiences, all of us. Um, and a scene, I guess the whole scene is like, don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> because um, you, you don't know what anyone is going through. You don't know what their life is. You don't know what they've experienced. You don't know how they've come to be. So don't judge and I'll try and understand and connect through love. Thank you. Sophie. I think similar to, to what you were saying, just the authenticity, authenticity of those, those family moments and, and the scenes with, um, with Sam and, and Yutande and Buki and just that love. And I was like, oh, this is like, this is home. This is home for me. And, and yeah, 
to be able to just have that on screen is yeah precious 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 you can always come back to me here let's say grace Ni oruko Jesu ni agbara eje Jesu. Oluwa Olorun ka bi siba. Father in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this food and bringing Kara back to us. Without her there was a hole in our family. Thank you for your grace and for your love. In Jesus mighty name we pray. Amen. Imran. Um <coughs> I loved all of it. Um there were so many different parts to it um, that were, you know, that you that you have to love. I think so. So I love that scene that you were talking about, where the where the family is then they and they break into um, a, a different language, a Yoruba, I think, because I because that's something I relate to. I know that when, when I was growing up, my parents would be speaking to me in Punjabi and we'd be answering in English, or, or we'd switch, and that I th I thought gave it something that I've I've not seen before. Thank you. Sam, director, you mentioned uh, it was a closet scene for you, but is that the actual scene or do you have another one? Um, no, it's probably not, actually. Uh, I, I'm glad you said uh, the family one, so I don't have to, but I think that is one of my favourites as well. Yeah, just um, and respect to the producers as well, because it wasn't in the script. And I was like, I think, you know, we cast Sam and I asked him on the day, I said, what do you speak under the language? And he's like, Yoruba. So then I went to the casting and director to Gary and said, the mum and the sister have to speak this. And everyone's like, but it's not in the script. And I was like, it doesn't matter. It will give us a level that we need. And we got it. Um, and, they, the, you know, the producers were like, shoot it both ways. Let's see which way it falls. And uh, Again, you go with a better idea. And that was the better idea. So we went with that. So that's not mine. That's yours, Aquian, so, which is good. Um, I've got two. Can I pinch two? There's a scene in it for between Sophie and Sam. And she's on this bed. And she's virtually whispering to him and it is beautiful uh we're going to do the mix on friday and they sent it me yesterday and we put some music on it and i said to the to, um uh the, our, our music composer i said i think you're putting too much on like just pull it back she's great in it and sophie is amazing in that scene it literally is both of them and it holds it moves in it moves back uh and i remember at the end of the day i said to sophie you know, me and Sophie had a word. We both had a cry because we were like really proud of what, what she did. Do you remember, Sophie? Yeah, it was just, it was just, it, that's what we're talking about. You know, it's just really connects with the heart. Um, I think that's a wonderful scene. And then there's one at the end of Ep 2, which is pretty much three minutes in the back of a car. Uh, and Sam's not even speaking. It's just voiceover. And I think that's really brave for a show to do that, to just have three minutes of somebody sat in the back of a car. It's not as boring as I'm making it sound, but it's pretty, pretty nice, I thought, yeah. Uh, they'll be mine, I think. Thank you. And Sam, actor. <laughs> There's lots of scenes. There's the scene in the back of the car as well that even though I'm in it, I was getting emotional. I was just like, wow, like, this guy's in like a really like, tough situation. Um, and then I hadn't seen it yet, but I remember doing it on the day. There was a scene where um, we were all family and, and Kurt as well mm -hmm. he's another character you haven't met played by the beautiful <laughs> Toyn Barrett um and we're all like in this sort of house and um, like this bed sit situation and um and uh so Hero and Kyra are like kind of watching the family sort of having fun smiling and dancing and all this stuff and uh Hero just says to her like you know they're also like yours you know that this is your family too this is you know, you're a part of this. I just think, I just think all those sorts of moments are just like really, really beautiful um, and, and tell that like, the real story of, of love. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, thanks to the panel and BBC Drama. You can all see You Don't Know Me on BBC One starting from December 5th. And if you've enjoyed this discussion, then the BFI is a charity organisation and details on how to donate will appear on your screen shortly. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye.